Okay, we're going to go ahead and dive right in. Let us pray, and we'll jump into our information. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for these people who are participating, whether they're doing this live or via recording. I just thank you for their discipline and their diligence. I want to grow in your word and grow in maturity so that they can be like you and that we can live lives worthy of the gospel. And I just pray that this um, time we spend together would facilitate that. I pray all this in your name, Lord. Amen. All right. Well, excited to get started again with you guys. Um, real quick, before we dive in, I'm just curious, do we have any questions from last week or the previous weeks? Just anything that's outstanding in your mind that um, maybe is confusing to you that you want clarity on uh, before we continue? And it could be about anything. It could be about the inductive study process. It could be about you know what we've learned in the book of John up to this point. Totally up to you. I uh, just want to give you that chance. You can either ask me uh, via the phone or your microphone, or you can type it in the text or in the chat area, and we'll answer those questions. I'm going to assume from the cacophony of silence that there are no questions. So this must mean that you guys are killing this deal, cranking it, no worries whatsoever, and that's good to hear. So with that said, let's dive into Chapter 7 of our book, How to Study Your Bible, the when, the where, and the why. Now, you may recall that one of the things we want to do is ask the journalistic questions of who, what, when, where, why, and how. And uh, we do that, first of all, by observing the Scripture. You know, when we're going through each of our chapters, we're marking all the references to places. We're marking the references to time. We're making reference to or marking references to the author or to the recipients that the author is writing to, and we're trying to glean any information we can learn about them. But once we have done that, we then want to go to the next level, and the next level is to start to go to outside resources for information about when, where, and why. And the first thing we want to do is we want to really study the author. Now, last week, we talked about cross-referencing, and this is a powerful thing to do. You know, especially when it comes to being able to piece together the chronology of events, because we can find people who were together at different places and we can say, OK, well, they were with them over here and they were with them over here, which means these two events happened in this sequence. One of the things you can do, though, is you can start to make cross references like, um, you know, let's say that you find out that the author is John. So you could actually do a search in your concordance for the name John, and you could start to look up all the references to John. Now, obviously, there's going to be more than one John in the Bible. For instance, there's John, the disciple that Jesus loved, and then there's John the Baptist. But, but by reading in context, it's going to become clear to you whether you're reading about the same person or not. And so just by cross-referencing John's name across multiple books, you'll be able to find information about John that wasn't contained in the single book that you're studying or that you're reading. So that can become very, very helpful. Then the other thing, of course, is to turn to a credible commentary. Now, there are quite literally thousands of commentaries that are out there, and uh, I don't have time to really recommend any particular commentary because based on the book that you're studying, like the book of John or the book of Romans or the book of Isaiah, you know, the best commentaries are going to differ. But I would just tell you that you want to look for commentaries that are, you know, written by credible um, authors and that come from some sort of credible source. And if you have any questions about a commentary you're, you're considering, post that question with the name of the commentary you're considering into our Facebook group, into the Scott Ross Online Discipleship Group, and uh, we'll answer and I can give you my feedback on that particular author and that particular commentary. But within the commentaries, typically there will be an entire chapter dedicated to the authorship of the book and what we know about the author. There's also, for many of the famous men of the Bible, there are biographies that are written by real credible scholars. So we, for instance, have biographies on Paul, on Peter, uh, etc. So you can look up a lot of these men and women in the Bible, and there are, there are biographies written about them by scholars. So that's the first thing we want to do. The second thing we want to do is really understand the setting. You know, where is this being 
uh, where are the people living that are receiving this particular writing, this particular letter or this particular book? And what is the historical setting? So, again, we can do a lot of cross references to dates and times, but then we also can, again, turn to outside resources. So, for instance, Bible dictionaries are a great resource. They're, and a Bible dictionary is kind of a cross between an encyclopedia and a dictionary. Because if you were to look up Galilee, for instance, in a good Bible dictionary, it would not just give you the definition of Galilee as a city in um, Israel. It would give you a lot of background on Galilee. And then also the same commentaries are that you would pick for using to understand about the author are going to typically give you a lot of information about the historical setting, the location, what's going on at the time, you know, what's going on politically. You know, for instance, we're in the book of John right now, so we're within the time of the Roman Empire. And so you would learn who was in charge and what was the political setting then and how did it really work and what was the interaction between the ruling council of the Jews and the uh, government of the Roman Empire that existed within Judea at the time and uh, Jerusalem at the time. So, again, the, the outside sources can become very, very helpful to you, the commentaries and the Bible dictionaries. And so um, you want to start to look at those things because they're going to give you a lot of understanding and context, you know, especially as it comes to cultural references that are going to be made you know when when jesus teaches a, a, and he gives a parable he's going to make references to things that wouldn't necessarily mean as much to us like when he talks about uh, a shepherd and his sheep and he talks about the shit where the sheep are kept at night well we don't keep sheep and we don't have those same um common place ideas that would or we don't have um those frames of reference where when he talks about sheep and shepherds and where sheep sleep at night, that's not a common reference for us. So reading about that and reading about the historical setting is going to really help you gain insights into those analogies and stories and parables. So pretty basic, but it's a very big step in the observation process and the interpretation process. So with that said, do we have any questions about that? Going once going twice. Okay. So with that said, let's move into our study of the book of John, and I'm going to pull that up. Give me one second. So this week we get into a couple of my favorite chapters in the book of John, and the first chapter, uh, John chapter 9, is the famous story of Jesus healing the man born blind. And the first thing I want us to do is I want us to go through the scripture here and I want us to note everything that we learn about blindness or the blind. So with that said, let me move this out of the way so I can see you guys. Okay, so um, where is our first reference to blindness in this passage? Verse 2, exactly. Actually, it is verse 1. He says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And so then he's asked a question. And what's the question? Yeah, they say, who sinned? See, their theology was if something bad had happened to you, it had to be somebody's fault. It was like karma almost. You know, it's like, well, this guy's blind, so somebody did something wrong. So here's our question. Was it his parents that did something wrong, or was it him that did something wrong? And Jesus says in verse 3, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Okay, so then where's the next reference to being blind? I will just tell you it is verse 13. It says they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. So here's what, what is happening here. Christ puts mud and spit together. He rubs it on his eyes. He tells the guy to go wash off. And when the guy comes back, he can see. And everybody's flipping out. 
And he tells them, they ask him, how is it that you can see? And he says, this man named Jesus anointed me, and now I can see. So they bring him to the Pharisees. Now, what is the Pharisees' reaction? Well, they, they ask him how he received his sight. Of course, he says Jesus, and then they, are they fired up about this? Or they're like, oh my goodness, it's a sign. The Messiah has finally come. Praise God that this man who was blind can now see. Is that their response? They're leaping for joy. They're calling for a celebration that this poor blind man can now see. No, they're not happy. What are they focused on? They're focused on the Sabbath. Oh, well, this guy can't be a God. Oh, my goodness. He's, he's causing blind to see on the Sabbath. What an evil person this must be. And so there's an argument that breaks out because half the people, they're saying, yeah, but how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? So it says in verse 18, the Jews did not believe what? Yeah, they didn't believe he had been blind. They're like, oh, okay, no, I see how this is. This guy wasn't really blind. This is some sort of like scam to make us think he was blind. Like this is some sort of thing. They've got it all set up where this guy acts like he's blind. And then this Jesus guy shows up. And so what did they do about that? Yeah, they asked his parents. And his parents are like, yeah, he's our son. And he was born blind. But now he sees, and we don't know how he sees. Let him speak for himself. And uh, they feared the Jews. So here's the crazy thing. The parents have a son born blind. Now, if you had a son born blind, uh, you're probably praying for his sight. And now the answer comes, and what happens? They are so scared of the Jews that they can't even rejoice for their son seeing because they're like, hey, We'll let him talk for himself. They feared the Jews. What does that tell you about the nature of the Pharisees? Does that tell you that the Pharisees had a reputation for godliness, for kindness? No, it's not like all of a sudden, just because Jesus showed up, the Pharisees all of a sudden become mean and intimidating. It's clear that they were, yeah, that's exactly right, Todd and Karen. It's clear they were bullies. It's clear that people feared them already. And so, his parents say in verse 23, he's of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who'd been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Where have you heard that before? I was blind. Now I see. That's right. The famous hymn, Amazing Grace. It's taken straight from this passage. The writer of that hymn was, of course, uh, a slave trader. And he was one of the most prolific slave traders of his day. And... He was radically saved, and when he became saved, he was heartbroken and beside himself with grief and guilt over what he had done to all of those human beings. And he began to think back on them, and he could see their faces and see their suffering in his in his memory. And uh, it just absolutely um, ate him up. And God came to him and spoke to him and God's grace was sufficient. And so he says, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Uh, I was lost, but um, now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And he takes it from this passage right here. Okay. So then where's the next reference to blindness? Yes. Verse 32, it says, Let's go back to verse 31. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Excuse me. Sorry about that. 
So, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. This is crazy. This is the first time in history that anybody can recall something like this happening. And so let's keep reading. It says, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter, utter sin, and would you teach us? Now, what is this? This is an interesting thing here. What are the Pharisees doing here? What are they saying here? Exactly. Pharisees aren't sinners. Pharisees weren't born sinful too. And they're also going back to the mistake that the disciples made at the beginning. This guy was blind, therefore he must have been born in sin, right? Like there must have been something that he was being punished for or that his parents were being punished for. We've learned that that's no longer the case, but they're still stuck in this backward way of thinking. And they also are extremely arrogant. You would dare to teach us? And they cast him out. This is the ultimate example of the messenger getting shot. This poor guy didn't do anything wrong. He's sitting there blind. I mean, if you're blind and a person comes and heals you and all of a sudden you can see, you think you're not going to be fired up about that? Of course, he's not the one who healed somebody on the Sabbath. Christ is the one who healed somebody on the Sabbath. But they're so mad and they're so filled with arrogance and pride that they cast the guy who's been healed out. Now, Jesus... He heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him. It is he who is speaking to you. By the way, yet another example of Jesus claiming deity for those liberals and liberal theologians who would say that Jesus never said such things. You have seen him. It is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Again, you don't worship prophets. You don't worship angels. You don't worship rabbis. You worship deity alone. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see. And those who see may become blind. What's he saying there? What's he talking about? For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Yeah, if they don't believe, they're going to become blind. He's talking about those that know they're lost, those that know they're blind, he's going to help them see. And those that think they can see, they're going to, they're going to become the blind ones. They're going to become hardened. They're not going to be able to um, come to salvation. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? You can just hear it. Oh, so we're blind, I guess, huh? Guess we're the blind ones. Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Once again, Jesus goes in and deals with a real practical issue, just like he's done before. He dealt with the woman at the well who wants real physical H2O, the water, and then he moves it into a theological discussion about a water that will cause you to never thirst again. Here we've got a person who's physically blind. He heals him and gives him physical sight, but then he explains there's a deeper theological truth here that there are those who are lost and they will be able to be found. They can't see and they're going to be given sight. And there are those who they think they've got sight already and their pride will blind them to being able to accept the free gift of salvation. So chapter nine, very famous chapter. And, uh, you know, obviously the discussions about the, uh, the blind and the seeing uh, significant metaphor for us. Any questions about that before we move into chapter 10? All right. So let's move into chapter 10. This is another very famous passage. The Good Shepherd he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, 
for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? And others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So what do we learn about sheep? Let's look at every reference to sheep and see what we learn. What's the first reference to sheep we've got? I think the first reference is verse Two, although in verse one we talk about the sheepfold, the sheepfold is the little pin that the sheep stay in. So the first thing we see is that sheep are housed in a sheepfold. Now, you're like, yeah, so what? Okay, let's just, just make sure we know. Sheep don't always stay out in a pasture. There are times that sheep are in this little pin. The second thing we learn is that there is a shepherd for the sheep. Sheep have shepherds, right? He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Next, what do we learn? In verse 3, yes, the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd. What else? Yes, sheep are called by name and they are owned by the shepherd so there are sheep that belong to a specific shepherd so there's this sheep for this shepherd and then this other sheep for this other shepherd and the sheep only respond to the voice of their shepherd because they hear his voice and then what do we learn in verse 4 well, that's true about the shepherd leading. We're going to come back and see what we find out about the shepherd in a minute, but that's a great point. Uh, let's say, though, that first thing is that the sheep follow their shepherd. So they know his voice and they follow him. So what is the hallmark of a sheep that is identified with a particular shepherd? What can we say or two things that if this is your shepherd for sure you these two things are true of you that's exactly right don you know your shepherd's voice and you follow him let me ask you this if you say that guy's my shepherd but you don't know his voice is he really your shepherd no if you say, that guy's my shepherd, but when that guy leads, you don't follow him, is he really your shepherd? No. So this becomes a good litmus test, does it not? If we claim that some person is our shepherd, but we A, don't know his voice, so we can't respond to him when he calls, and B, or B, we don't respond, we do not follow him, 
are we being accurate? Are we telling the truth when we say, that's my shepherd right there? No, absolutely not. Okay, so let's continue on. What do we next l learn about sheep? Verse 7. By the way, I, yes, uh, Shelly is absolutely right. Their sheep have a door. They have a door that they go in and out of to get to their pen, to get to their, their place of safety. There aren't multiple doors to go through that are safe. There's a door to go through that is safe. But I want to go back to verse 5. What do we learn about, a sheep, about the sheep in verse 5? Yeah, they don't follow strangers, do they? They what? Strangers. They flee. They flee. Now, let's go back to a previous lesson. Jesus accused the Pharisees of having someone as their father that was not very flattering. Do you remember who that was? The devil. That's right. Satan. So when Satan spoke to them, did they flee? No, they didn't flee. So what are we learning here? Why didn't they flee? They didn't flee because the devil was no stranger to them. They knew his voice. They followed him. If we find ourselves following after voices and leadership and influences that are not Christ, it means that we have too much familiarity with those things, that they are no longer strangers to us. Because if those were strange voices and we had a true shepherd, what would we do when we, got, when we were um, presented with those influences and presented with those voices? What does it say we would do? That's right, we would flee. Do, do sheep flirt with trying to stay as close to the strange voice as possible without getting hurt? Do sheep say, I'll just hang out with this voice just a little while longer, it won't be that bad, and then I'll distance myself? Is that what sheep do? No. Sheep flee the voice of the stranger. All right, let's go back. Verse 8. What do we learn about sheep here? Yeah, the ones before him, the, the robbers and all that. Be, and who he's referring to here is most likely the Jewish religious leaders. Um, it can't mean the prophets, and there's a lot we could get into right here in terms of discussion that I don't want to bog us down. But it probably means like the Pharisees and stuff. The real sheep, the ones who are going to come to Christ, they never listen to those people. Okay, what do we next learn? Where do we next see sheep? What verse are we in? Well, let's skip down because even though we see references to sheep happening in verses, say, 11 and 12 we really don't learn anything about sheep because those are more references to things we learn about the shepherd until we get to verse 16 what do we learn about 16 yeah, yeah sheep that aren't in this fold where what is he referring to there well what I th what we think he's meaning there is the gentiles you see, everybody he's talking about or talking to that's sitting here listening to him right now is a Jew. But he says, I've got sheep that are in a different fold, and I've got to bring them in also, and they will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock. This is somewhat of a reference to what we see in Romans where it talks about the Gentiles being grafted in to the tree that is the nation of Israel, the, the, the plant he takes the branch that is the, the Gentiles and he grafts it in to the nation of Israel so that they're one plant bearing one fruit. And here he calls it one flock. Okay, so with that said, let's now go back to the top and list what do we learn about the shepherd? 
Where's the first reference to the shepherd? Yeah, he's the gatekeeper, right? And he doesn't have to sneak over the wall to get to the sheep. He can go directly in to the sheep. And then in verse 4, what do we see? Yeah, he leads them out. And then is he in the back of them? Is he on the side of them? No, he's in front of them. One of the things that I talk about a lot, I have... um. I actually have multiple discipleship groups running all at one time, and uh, one of my other discipleship groups is studying First Peter right now. It's a big, uh, it's a huge encouragement book, and you know, First Peter is written to those who are being persecuted, and in that study, we're seeing that Christ has provided us a living, breathing picture of what it looks like to deal with persecution and difficulty and do it in a way that is great with grace and power and humility and that impacts those around us. And, you know, this is just one example in the book of Hebrews. It says we do not have a brother that cannot understand a savior that cannot understand us, but rather we have one who has been tempted in every way that we've been tempted and yet did not sin. The beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that our savior, it, he goes before us he goes through everything that we'll go through, but he goes through it ahead of us. And he serves as an amazing leader and an amazing example for us at all times. So, um, you know, this harkens back to the Exodus when God went before the nation of Israel as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Our shepherd goes before us. The good shepherd goes before the sheep. Okay. What do we next learn? We're going to next see his reference to shepherd in verse 11. What kind of shepherd is he? He's a good shepherd. Is he a weak shepherd? Is he a negligent shepherd? No, he's a good shepherd. Now, if you're talking to these people, they know what a good shepherd is. What kind of shepherd is a good shepherd? Remember, a sheep is your livelihood. Sheep is are super valuable to your family. And if you have a shepherd that you entrust with your sheep, what are you counting on? You're counting on that they keep all the wolves at bay. They're, you're counting on that they don't fall asleep on the job. And lastly, what you just had referenced and what he references himself, you're counting on that the shepherd would actually lay down his life for his sheep. And what kind of shepherd is this that we're following? A good shepherd that lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand won't do it. Why won't the hired hand do it? Yeah, it's perfectly stated. He doesn't have any skin in the game. He, you know, he's just getting paid a wage. Why is he going to risk his life for a few bucks? You know, that's not the deal. But the shepherd is part of the family. In fact, the shepherd owns those sheep. And so the shepherd cares about those sheep because the sheep are his life. And so he says here, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. How many shepherds will there be ultimately? We see this at the end of verse 16. Yes, there will be one. Okay, let's skip down to verse 22. And I just want to read through this section with you from 22 to 40. And then I want to turn to our book and read through all the things we learn about sheep because there's a lot of insights we're going to gain says at that time the feast of dedication took place at jerusalem i hope you marked your reference to time and your reference to a place there it was winter another reference to time and jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of solomon so the jews gathered around him and said to him how long will you keep us in suspense if you are the christ tell us plainly jesus answered them i told you and you do not believe the works that i do in my father's name bear witness about me but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And here's the big one. I and the Father are one. Absolute declaration of deity right there. And you know what, how you can tell? Verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. 
Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. What are they saying? We're stoning you because you just claim to be God. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. There was no ambiguity for the Jew, especially in the first century. Maybe there's ambiguity for you, liberal scholar, working in some ivory tower in Princeton. There is no ambiguity for the first century Pharisee who was an absolute um, scholar when it came to the law and the Old Testament. They knew what Jesus was saying. Jesus answered them, it is not written in your, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him who the father consecrated and sent into the world, you're blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God. If I am not doing the works of my father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me. And I am in the Father, another claim to deity, another reference to the Trinity. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. Now, here's what's interesting. We don't know this to be true. I'm purely conjecturing here, so this is not scripture. But you got to understand, he's surrounded by people with rocks. And they're about to stone the guy. And then all of a sudden, he's gone. You know, I don't want to read too much into the scripture, but Something miraculous happens every single time. Like the guy just disappears. I don't know if he teleports. I don't know what goes on. But somehow he's always surrounded by a mob of Pharisees. And the next thing you know, he's not there. He's disappeared from their midst. And they can't find him to save their life. So again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first. By the way, this is another thing that I think is kind of crazy. Jerusalem, when you go. You're going to find out where he is in this scene here, where he's at, you know, the portico of Solomon. He's in Jerusalem. Next thing you know, one verse later, he went away again across the Jordan. These are not close together. They're nowhere near each other. They are very far apart. If you're driving in a car at 60 miles an hour, it's about a three-hour drive. And boom, he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him. And they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And again, many believed in him there. What do we see a connection between right there in those last two verses? It's something we've talked about before. Mm, Not John. That's a good answer, uh, but there's a connection that we've seen throughout the entire book of John. Between this thing and this other thing. And we see them both right there in verse 41 and 42. Yes, signs and belief. There's signs so people believe. He says, and the people said to Christ, John did no sign. But everything John said about this man was true. And many believed in him. Why they believe? Because they've been seeing these signs. The healing of the blind. uh, The turning the water into wine, etc. Okay. Any last questions about that? And I want to read, um, I want us to turn in our books um, to uh, into your John study to this page here that's right after day six. And it starts with this phrase deity or this, this heading deity. So if you're there, I'm just going to read. It says deity, John 1, 14. Then in the margin of John 1, 14, write deity along with the refer- next reference and so on. Um, now, under that, it says insights on sheep. Here we go. Number one, the life of a sheep depends a lot on what kind of shepherd it has. If the sheep has a mean or cruel shepherd, it would probably suffer and its life would be hard. If the shepherd were lazy and didn't take care of the sheep, it might be hungry or even starve. But if the shepherd was gentle and brave and didn't think of himself first, then the sheep would grow to be healthy, strong, content, and happy. Number two, more than any other kind of animal, sheep need attention and care. The shepherd must protect the sheep from cougars, wolves, dogs, and thieves. The shepherd must protect his sheep at all times of the day and night. How does God protect us? At what time does he protect us? All the time. 
Exactly right. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Do we need protection? Do we have wolves at our door? Are there thieves in our life? Absolutely. Number three, sheep are timid and fearful animals. Animals They get scared very easily, and this fear keeps them from doing many things that are good for them. Does this sound familiar? How many of you have ever been struck by fear, and there was the thing you knew would be good for you, but you can't even bring yourself to do something you know would be good for you because the fear is so significant? This analogy between us and sheep is very appropriate. Number four, sheep are mass-minded. They have mob instincts. They will all do what every other sheep is doing. If one sheep gets scared and runs, all the others will run with it, whether or not they know why they are running. Does this sound familiar? (laughs) Number five, sheep are animals of habit. They like to keep following the same trails over and over. They will keep grazing on the same land until they practically ruin the land. And they will eat bad grass. Man, how many of us have eaten bad grass because we keep trotting the same turf over and over and over? We keep expecting something new to take place, but we keep doing the same thing. Number six, sheep are also known to be very stubborn animals. They need the shepherd to guide them around. Now, have you seen a shepherd's crook? How's a shepherd's crook look? On one end, it's got a hook, and on the other end, it's just a poker. So sheep are either getting poked or pulled because they're stubborn. Oftentimes, they need poked or pulled. Does a good shepherd pull his sheep to get them in the right direction? Does a good shepherd prod or poke his sheep? Does it make him less good to poke or prod them? Or is part of being good his willingness to poke, prod, and pull us? Number seven, sheep are very stupid. Dumb animals. They will sometimes just freeze if there's danger around. They won't even try to run to safety. They will panic and just sit there. Many times they won't even cry out for help. Number eight. It's easy to tell who owns the sheep because each shepherd gives his sheep an earmark. The earmark is like a brand mark. The sheep cuts a certain mark into each one of the sheep's ears, and each shepherd gives all his sheep the same earmark. So when we say the earmarks of blah, 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 that is from shepherding. Should we as sheep who follows the shepherd Christ all have the same earmarks? Sheep will not lie down. And rest unless, A, they are not afraid, B, they get along with all the other sheep, C, they do not have any flies or pests bothering them, and D, they're not hungry. So the only way to get for the sheep to rest is to be without fear, in harmony with their other sheep, no flies or pests, and belly full. And what does our shepherd say to us? He says that he will cause us to lie down And he will give us rest. That means that he's taking away our fear. He's going to create unity with other sheep. He's going to get rid of all the things that bother us. And he's going to fill us. We're going to be content and happy. Pretty rock solid. Number 10. Sheep will butt each other with their heads. They also have a, quote, butting order. That's spelled B-U-T-T-I-N-G, a butting order. See, the oldest sheep usually has the highest position of power. If a younger sheep is eating in a patch of grass the oldest one wants, he'll butt the younger one out of the way. The younger ones will act just the same way to sheep younger than themselves. But when the shepherd comes around, the sheep forget what they were fighting over, and they stop fighting, 
and they behave themselves. <laughs> My goodness. Number 11. A sheep has to have good land to feed on or it will stay hungry. If a sheep is hungry, it will stay on its feet and constantly be searching for food to satisfy its hunger. Sheep cannot sleep if they are hungry, and they are not much good to the owner if they stay in that condition. They get nervous and upset very easily, and if they don't eat the right food, all sorts of things will bother them. Who's ever gotten ornery because you were hungry? Number 12. Sheep are bothered by many different pests. All kinds of flies, mosquitoes, gnats, and other flying insects bother sheep. Many of these insects will aim straight for the nose of the sheep. If they get in the sheep's nose, they may lay eggs. When the eggs hatch, the larva will get into the passages of the nose and cause swelling and irritations and sometimes blindness. The sheep will beat their heads against trees or rocks to try to get these pests to stop bothering them. Sometimes they even, they, the pests may even kill the sheep. Other sheep will shake their head for hours and hours at a time. Some will run until they just drop from running so much. The first time a good shepherd sees this happening to a sheep, he puts oil on the sheep's head and around the nose. And this will calm the sheep. Number 13, sheep have to have water. A sheep's body is 70% water, so water has a lot to do with how healthy and strong a sheep stays. Sheep get their water mainly from three places, springs and streams, deep wells, and dew that's on the grass. Yes, dew on the grass. Sheep can go for long periods of time if they can get the dew off the grass early in the morning before the sun evaporates it. As the deer pants for water, so my soul pants for thee. We could say as the sheep pant for the morning dew. So our soul should pant for Christ. Number 14, sheep can become cast down. This means that they get turned over on their backs and they cannot get up again by themselves. If the shepherd doesn't come to the sheep quickly, the sheep will die. Once the shepherd finds a sheep that is in this position, he speaks to it gently and rubs its legs and gets its circulation going again. A sheep becomes cast down because it's looking for a soft spot, because it has too much wool, or because it's just too fat. So here's what happens. The sheep is trying to find a place of real comfort, or it's just gotten too fat or overgrown with wool, and so it flops over on its back, and then it can never get up again. Have you ever encountered a human, maybe yourself, that in the search for comfort, for sloth, or because of pure becoming too fat, we flop down in one spot and we find that we could die there unless someone comes along and gets our circulation moving again. And last but not least, in the sheepfold, the place where the sheep sleep, the shepherd lies down in the opening or the doorway to guard the sheep. If thieves or predators try to get in and hurt the sheep, they have to cross over the shepherd because the shepherd is literally the door. So think about that when Christ is using his metaphor of being the door. He's the good shepherd that lies down in the path of danger to cover the um, exit and entry to the sheep fold. And the only way in and out is through him. The only way to get out is through him. The only way to get in is through him. The powerful metaphor. So, any last thoughts, insights before we move on? I hope this has been edifying. I highly recommend that you guys will read the last section of that study, the, uh, the thought that, that she leaves you with. It's called the uh, Thought for the Week. It's a very edifying read. Uh, make sure that you take the time to read that. Quick key piece of housekeeping. We are, I am going to be in another country over the next two weeks. So we are not going to meet during our time over the next two weeks. But here's what we're doing instead. 
What I want you guys to do is post any sort of theological or discipleship questions that you may have on our Facebook page. And what I'm going to do is take those questions and I'm going to record videos that answer those questions. So it's kind of a theological free for all. And then next week at this time, a video will go up answering the first set of questions. And then the next week, a video will go up answering the second set of questions. So you can spend the same time. You can keep it on your calendar, but you can just get on YouTube or the Facebook page and watch the videos that answer those questions. So be thinking up a good theological question, post it out there, and we'll take the best ones and make two videos that answer them. With that said, guys, God bless you. Uh, be encouraged, and I'll see you again very, very soon. Bye-bye.